Okay, so welcome everyone to our first ever social media careers panel. Um, as many people know, social media is now a key part of life for, for so many, covering leisure time, our personal lives, and also our working lives now as well. But how much do you really know about what goes on behind the scenes of that Instagram account or maybe the YouTuber that you subscribe to? And what might that look like in terms of opportunities for working in social media yourself or a company and developing a career in that industry? Well, we've brought together a panel of alumni from varying angles of the industry to give you valuable insight and hopefully some inspiration into what these opportunities might be. Um, we're delighted to have with us today Jess Bolton, who's a social media specialist, Instagram and TikTok creator. Um, Courtney um, Daniela Bote, social media content creator and digital entrepreneur. Nia Owen, who is social media coordinator for a company called Gearset. And William Lloyd, head of social analytics at YouTube. Um, I'm Jane Ansell, one of the careers consultants here at the Career Service, and my colleague Catherine and Alexander will join us a little bit later to help manage the questions towards, towards the end of the session. Um, and as we said, if you could put those in the Q&A, that would be great. So the format of the session is that each panellist in a moment will have a chance to just talk for about five minutes, a little bit about themselves, their current role. Um, and then I'll put some questions to each of the panellists um, and we'll have a discussion around those. And then it'll be your turn in the audience to ask some questions. So as you said, pop these in the Q&A as you think of them and we'll read those out later. So I'll go around my screen. Um, Courtney, you're first at the top of my screen there. So do you just want to kick us off by saying a little bit about yourself, your current role and what a, a typical day might look like for you? Sure. So hi, everybody. My name is Courtney Daniela Boating. Um, I am 25 years old. I live in London, born and raised in London. But um, I started my YouTube channel in my first year of university um, at Robertson College. Yeah, YouTube, TV, YouTube all the way. But um, I started uh, my channel then just to have transparent and honest conversations on the internet about all aspects of life, from education to personal development um, to faith. And it took off really well. And it has been something I've been doing since then. I am a full time creator and that takes the form of my YouTube channel, other social media platforms as well for short form content, as well as being the co-founder um, of To My Sisters, which is a digital sisterhood community where we use content and conversations to facilitate women's wellness growth and development. And that is something I've been doing since 2020. And it's been an absolutely amazing journey. We are currently about to publish our debut book, um, which is called To My Sisters, A Guide to Building Life long friendships and it's mainly taking the form of a podcast right now um, which has about th over three million downloads in the last two years which is really fun and we facilitate people's um, like offline experiences and events for women resources for women's growth just connecting women globally with each other um, and helping them discover themselves and that's all through the power of content and the internet so yeah um, I'm also the founder of CDB London London, which is an e-commerce beauty brand um, so yeah the internet is where I do all my amazing stuff and I love it <laughs> so oh, in terms of oh, yeah. what a day my life looks like mm. it there is no <laughs> there is no there is no two days alike um, there are days where you know I'm spending eight nine hours recording um, for the podcast for my YouTube channel for short form um, and then there are days where I'm spending 12 hours just sat at my laptop editing or you know having to respond to emails I was literally complaining um, to Jane and Catherine earlier that like this whole month of January has seemed to be me just reading contracts after contract mm -hmm. regarding social media brand deals or signing to a management agency or you know working on our audio book it's just been reading and sending things back for revision so um, every day really does look different from designing to scripting um, to editing and having to be my own legal team it seems so yeah that's that's pretty much me wow that's great so really varied there that's fantastic thank you Courtney um, thank you Nia you're next on my screen do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself sure um so I'm Nia um I'm 27 and I live in Cambridge but I am from Wales um, so I work for Gearset, we're the fastest um, growing startup in Cambridge, and we also have offices in Chicago and Belfast. 
and um, we make software for developers using a platform called Salesforce. Um, my day-to-day -day is sort of var variable, but also I have certain things that I do do every day. Um, so I'm in charge of um, sourcing, writing, and scheduling the daily social media posts. Um, Gearset has a LinkedIn and a Twitter. So I'm in charge of coming up with the content for that and preparing it and make sure it, making sure it gets reviewed. And, and um, I also um, engage with the community on, on those channels to boost our profiles and posts. And then I'm also in charge of um, writing longer copy for our blog on um, technical topics related to um, our product. So it involves a lot of, um, uh, you know, learning te difficult technical things. And then also um, I had to learn to code to put the um, blog post on the website. Um, and just to preface that I don't have any, um, like my degree is in art history and my master's is in film screen studies. So I don't have any um, technical experience. So this was all kind of learned on the roll. And also, Gisa is a very collaborative company, so it almost feels like I work more in marketing than social media, even though social media is my um, my area. So I'm always kind of copy editing other things that are coming through in the team, like, you know, emails or um, copy for events and things like that. And then other kind of more variable aspects are like the ways that I want to kind of beef out the role. So I'll um, I recently did a social media strategy and looked into accessibility stuff on social media and um, researching other platforms that might work for us, um, like YouTube. Uh, we already have a channel, but we want to work on optimizing that this year. Um, and then also covering events. So our, most of our customers are US. So we have a lot of US events that we run or that we attend. So I'm hoping that this year I'll be able to cover those a bit more. Um, but yeah, I think that's everything. Great, lovely. Thank you, Nia. Um, Will, you're next. Hey guys, uh, thanks for that. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Will. Uh, nice to meet you all. I graduated from St. Catharines in 2000, 2008, uh, and then I went straight off to, in fact, one of my best mates at CATS did a summer internship at Google, and uh, I had no interest or inclination in, in applying there beforehand. I was all about, you know, uh, banking, consultancy, that's what, what, I, what I had in mind. And uh, my friend Dom came back from fantastic summer internship and he said, Will, you should apply to Google. Uh, you'd love it there. Uh, I actually missed the deadline uh, to apply, but then he emailed the recruiter and said, hey, can you give this guy like an extension? And thankfully <laughs> he, he sent that and I managed to get an offer and I went straight um, into to join Google uh, in the the AdWords team, as it was called back then, um, I was approving text ads in Dublin, you know, answering customers' calls right down the, the, the sort of the entry level role uh, as pretty rapid education in sort of online contraband and and all the kinds of things you don't want people to be selling online uh, was mostly what I was involved in, which was pretty fascinating. Uh, over the couple of years, then that progressed more to working on um, ad tech and specifically on measurement techniques, so understanding how people uh, behave on the internet, how uh, customers buy and sell things, and being able to measure and track um, performance, uh, which then naturally then kind of brought me to the role that I'm in now. So 14 years at Google, I, I've now been, so I moved to, to YouTube four years ago, uh, where I'm now the head of um, social and behavioral analytics, um, which means that I'm responsible for understanding uh, how folks are behaving on our platform. So behavioral data you know, entails things like uh, what traffic sources people are coming in from, how long are they spending on the videos, what content categories are they watching, what are they being, what factors cause them to be retained versus, you know, to, to, to not uh, return to, to YouTube. So that's behavioral analytics and social analytics looks more at um, external social media data, uh, where I look at helping our teams measure and understand uh, how our social posts are performing. Obviously, YouTube's got huge social presence across Twitter. I think we're like the 11th largest Twitter handle uh, in the world. Um, our, our Instagram handle's got like 35 million followers, so a huge social footprint. And I'm partly responsible for measuring the performance of those posts, but also measuring the performance 
of our marketing campaigns and our product and policy launches and how people are talking about those on social. So we, we would call that um, earned social, how people are talking about things that you haven't necessarily sent out yourself. And then owned social would be how people are responding to content that you actually own, posts that we actually put out there. So my social analytics responsibilities kind of transcend both owned and earned. I look at performance of campaigns. I look at our brand and reputational issues. I look at, you know, are people upset about changes to our policies or our products? Uh, you know, what happened when we moved the position of the of the dislike uh, of the comments um, section or the dislike button was removed? I mean, God forbid you remove the dislike button on YouTube. That would give us like two years worth of, uh, of negative uh, conversation on social media. Uh, I'll tell you more about that if you're interested. But uh, yeah, so kind of covers all of that, covers challenges around creators and uh, uh, some of the you know, issues that we're seeing right now around misinformation and how do we handle uh, suspensions and creative code of conduct. So yeah, kind of spans internal, external data, all of which comes together to help um, power our, our product and our marketing um, strategies um, across EMEA. Great, well, thank you. Really interesting for a completely different angle on, on the social media side of things there. So that's really interesting. Um, and Jess, last but not least, Hi, my name is Jess. I'm also a CATS graduate. I graduated in 2015. I did MML and have done absolutely nothing related to anything that I studied <laughs> ever since then. Um, but I essentially run um, what started off as an Instagram account for my dog, um, who is an anxious whippet. <laughs> it's called Worried Whippet. And over the last three years, I have um, grown it across multiple channels into something that now looks more like a business. Um, and in November, I took the leap and I'm now doing this more or less full time. Um, so in terms of what that looks like, it looks like um, an audience of 250,000 people across Instagram, TikTok. Since everybody's mentioning YouTube, I have a little fledgling YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, I basically um, the work that I do is incredibly varied, like everything that Courtney said rings true for the way that I work as well. Um, so I work, I do things like uh, my main source of income is brand partnerships. So I work with brands like uh, Oatly or dog food brands like Fourth Glade or uh, clothing brands like Tog24, like a really broad range of brands um, essentially advertising their services on my platform, like a standard sort of influencer setup. Um, but then I also have a merchandise shop. So I'm sitting here surrounded by like hoodies and calendars and I don't know what else. Um, and I um, have a Patreon, a subscription service where um, my followers sign up and pay a monthly fee to get more content from me. Um, and yeah, I recently earned my first seven pounds on YouTube. So Ooh. it's... <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys um it's a really broad spread of stuff it's really good fun oh also um have also been doing some writing and have a book coming out in august so um it's the whole spectrum um it's really interesting and really good fun um and no two days look the same this morning at 8 a.m i was in bills with my dog in her pajamas filming a brand partnership for admiral insurance this afternoon again like courtney has been contracts and trying to understand legal jargon um the biggest challenge I found so far working for myself is um, accounts do not come easily to me, but um, when you're running like a one man business, you do kind of have to have your fingers in all the pies. And unfortunately, like accounting is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the reality of it. But um, I am also loving working for myself. Um, I think um, if you've got kind of an entrepreneurial impulse building a social media following for yourself is a, a really great way to be able to exercise that um I think it opens lots of doors it's really exciting and yeah I think that's that's me great excellent thank you so much everyone that's given us a really good uh general kind of view as to what you all do and it's all really quite different there um so I'll we'll go to a few questions now and um the first few questions really to all of you. So anybody just kind of chip in, you know, when, when you're ready. Um, I'd love to know at what point, if there was a point when you thought, I want to work in social media, did you have that kind of light bulb moment? Um, and what kind of led you to explore that sort of area? Anybody just unmute and go for it. Um, so my background is I came out of university and went straight to work for a sexual health company um, and I've been working 
until November in sexual and reproductive health, primarily in social media. And for me, I was really excited to see that, like where there was this big sort of national taboo and you were looking at um, people who had very limited knowledge, like all of us did, like we've all been through sex ed in schools, it's terrible. Um, social media was this great opportunity to connect with people um, individually outside of those systems that were kind of failing to do the work. And um, I, it was a great educational resource. That was really exciting for me. I had a, I mean, I, I had a long time working in ads. And so I was working on the internet the entire time um, in that space. But for a long time, I had this feeling while I was working in online ads that I was doing something that even though lots of people were seeing, people weren't really like, you know, people don't love ads. Uh, it didn't really bring like joy. To my life, uh, it didn't. I didn't feel like the content that I was working on was was being reaching um, people in, in a very positive way. Uh, and so, when I had the opportunity to work for for YouTube and specifically to to work on social media at YouTube, um, I was really excited by the idea to reach you know billions, literally two and a half billion people every day, um, see something on YouTube, and to be part of that and to be part of getting messages out there to. 90 million followers um, on Twitter, 35 million followers on Instagram. It was very exciting um, and, a, and a very different sort of approach than working on ads, which are you know, kind of pay the bills, but are relatively boring. So th yeah, I think it was that light bulb moment for me was going from something slightly um, mundane to something quite exciting and something with a lot of eyeballs on it and a lot of exposure um, and a lot of, you know, kind of risk I felt pretty exciting. Will. Anybody else like to? Um, I think for me, mine came quite recently. Like I've always been a lover of social media as a consumer of it. Um, and it's always been a great hobby, but it wasn't until maybe two years ago that I thought I really want to do this, which was kind of catapulted by my love of the fact that every day is different. So it allowed me to kind of just explore all these other really fun things but not have to commit to anything so I'd actually say that that was my like driving force the fact that I still very much tell people I don't know what I want to be when I grow up but like I know I like a whole bunch of all of this stuff which fall very well under social media and you know the business and the entrepreneurship behind it so yeah that's kind of when I started to think I could do this full time and I also love the possibilities of the internet especially for positive impact um like whilst at Cambridge um, I studied HSPS at Robinson College um, and whilst there I did a lot of social media work in partnership with the university as well as individually to increase access diversity and inclusion and seeing the power of social media to kind of impact you know application trends and diversity at the university for me was really fulfilling you know you know viral campaigns um, that kind of championed black students and highlighted key issues um, that the university was facing for me helped me see the possibilities of social media and that's when I realized that like oh actually if I could focus on this that would be great. Right, thank you, Courtney. Nia, was there a, a moment for you when you just thought social media is where you want to be? Um, I guess mine was a bit um, more unusual. So I, um, like I said, I studied art history. Mm -hmm. And so when I came out of university, I was um, looking for work in museums. That's what I'd been doing. And um, I thought I wanted to be a curator. And then I thought I wanted to be a writer. And then um, when COVID hit, I um, moved to Spain to teach English kind of as a um, stopover while kind of figuring out what I wanted to do and um, I just knew that the arts industry wasn't where I wanted to be anymore and it just wasn't um, I think because I'm a really creative person I thought in my head it was like okay I need to work in the arts because that's mm. creative and then um, when I was in Spain I was um, I started using TikTok and I guess they were doing some kind of huge recruitment drive for um the tech industry but it was just all over my feed and they were actually just you know talking about the sort of engineering roles but through that I learned that um like the different kind of creative um roles that you could get in in tech and I just thought you know I that's just not something I kind of knew about um you know nobody in my family works in tech or anything like that 
Um, so that just kind of piqued my interest. And then the more I looked into it, I just thought this actually suits me a lot better. And I think the sort of lifestyle that comes with it and um, the sort of what Courtney was saying, just the sort of um, flexibility and vari variability is something that I really need. And I just happened to find um, the role that was kind of perfect for me and in a company that kind of allows me to do lots of different things and like take charge of the role in the way that I want to. Um, so it wasn't so much that I sort of decided on social media and worked backwards from there. It was more kind of thinking about what role suited what I needed and what I enjoyed, um, and sort of looking at my options a bit less like black and white. Yeah, great. That's that's really, really good to know. And um, so you've, you've all kind of touched a little bit on the, the bits that you really love about social media and working in that sort of kind of reaching the millions and billions of people and educating people and that side of things. But that kind of leads me on to think, well, what's the best part of your current role? What do you really enjoy about what you do the most? And that's to all of you again. So whoever wants to start. Um, I think I'd have to say two things, which is connecting with people, um, like building an online community on whatever platform is actually really fun. If you're if you find your people, like being able to find people who are interested in the, the niche things that you like and bond over that is really fun because you don't kind of find those connections, those specific connections in real life often. Um, however, I also love having an idea and then executing it I think it's so fulfilling even though it's really hard to like have the idea of like a a theme for a picture or a theme for a video and then having to piece it together and use visual audio storytelling and all of that aspect to construct something that's really engaging and fun um, and that people in that online community can bond over and so every time I make a video or like put out something I am super proud of it um, and I, I find that very fulfilling. And you've got something tangible to show for it as well haven't you there? Exactly and it's kind of like you you're see. building yeah. yeah you're building like a bit of a portfolio or like this kind of mm -hmm. you know showcase of hey like these are the things that I see in my brain out yeah. there for the world yeah great anybody else I can go um I think amongst uh, the, the the various types of analysis we run um the most rewarding or the stuff I'm most proud of is is uh analysis that we do which pertains to uh, what we call brand safety or, or, or keeping um, folks safe on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So making tough decisions around the types of content, the types of creators. And I, obviously my role isn't the person who goes reviewing the videos. There's a huge number of people whose job is to, to review videos and to check flagged videos and to, and to think about the policies. But what I provide uh, the lens I provide on that is to understand what the social media conversation is, what bubbling up trends and themes are happening, you know, like uh, and you, you can spot things in aggregate very quickly on social media, which perhaps, you know, once you'll have thousands of people reviewing individual videos, you kind of lose that kind of cohesion. So I think some of the proudest things that we've worked on for, for, in my team is being able to make recommendations around changes to some policies um, around harassment or hate speech. Um, or uh, yeah, around um, the, the types of content that we're allowed uh, to, to monetize. And it could be a pretty tricky um, sort of fine line to tread, right? On the mm. on one hand, not wanting to, to be overly um, causing censorship or, or, or restrictive in, in what people can say. Uh, but on the other hand, trying to keep a, a pleasant and friendly and safe environment, especially for, for young people, right? Um, where there's, there's so much terrible stuff out there. And so trying to help shape that. And you know, I, I, we haven't always got it exactly right, but I've been proud um, when we have been able to, to make some positive changes there. Thanks, Will. Anybody else about the, the best bits, what you really love about what you do? Um, yeah, I think for me, um, it's about the, variety and the fact that um like I really the fact that no two days are the same and that you never never really know what you'll be doing and you're always in the driver's seat like I really love working in that way mm. um, it means that I've got ADHD and it means that like whatever's captured my attention on that day is what I'm going to work on and if I don't do it then it doesn't happen and you know that's um like a really exciting feeling to wake up in the morning and be like what am I going to do today and what difference is it going to make to 
my business or the relationships that I have with the people who like follow these accounts and yeah and I would also echo um that sentiment about the connections that we make um like the platform that I run is as much a mental health platform as it is <laughs> stories about a dog and um and so you know every day you're having conversations with people that are like meaningful and lovely and they they might be deriving meaning from what you do and and vice versa and um that's a really special thing to have in your life okay Mia what about you um I think it's um sort of the variability that has already been mentioned but also how um social media is always shifting and always changing so something that might have worked last week might not work Mm -hmm. this week um so you're kind of always on your on your toes um and I think also um at least in in my role but just sort of being trusted with um like what you're sharing and like how you're sharing it like I enjoy that kind of um I guess it's it's similar if you're working for yourself but um yeah just being trusted with that sort of responsibility and because it is you know if you're promoting a business or anything there are certain things that you need to take into consideration so I, I like that kind of being trusted with with that mm-hmm. Great, thank you, everyone. Just looking back to when, because obviously our audience are, you know, mostly students today. Um, so when you were here at Cambridge, if you kind of reflect on your activities, so not only your academic studies, but your extracurricular activities, your hobbies, what you did in your spare time, um, they're often places where you really start to develop those key skills for um, for the working world and for your career. Are there particular skills that you really felt you start to develop started to develop here at university that you now use or you went on to develop further and if so where are good places for students now to be to be looking to start to develop those types of skills I'd say for me um, like I mentioned I started my YouTube channel my personal one in my first year of uni. So that was something that I worked on kind of as a side project. Um, And in the three years up until graduation, it kind of just built up to a point where I left able to be self-employed and kind of got used to every video was an opportunity to learn more about YouTube as a platform, learn more about social media and community engagement and what that looked like. So I would just say like, try and work on your own projects if you can, your own building your own platforms and getting used to it. But another thing that um, I was doing at university was I was the president of the African Caribbean Society at Cambridge. And they were a part of a lot of like viral campaigns um, that kind of got featured in the news. And so focus focusing on creating content which also exposed and delved into the issues we were facing as a community um, was really helpful. So if you can, you know, become a part of a society on campus who has a social media presence or maybe wanting to build one, um, that may also be a nice project for you to work on if you're trying to build something that's outside of yourself um, and, you know, that you, you can have a team around you to help you facilitate Um, I think also the workload of Cambridge for me meant that I was learning very much how to multitask and do the whole juggling thing and I think um, as Jess can kind of relate to it can get quite intense the amount of stuff you're bombarded with um, as you were trying to grow and as you were trying to navigate you know you've got merch you've got um, content that you're trying to put out and engaging with people and so I think the workload in itself and the diversity of um, trying to get a Cambridge degree definitely trains you to just work hard and know how to kind of discipline yourself to just get the work done and for a lot of people who work in social media you kind of even if you do work for a company you kind of have to have that very entrepreneurial um, like individualistic way of thinking because you're trying to create a persona online which is quite you know one thing um and I think knowing how to do that through academia has also helped me a lot I think I massively agree uh with that especially on the entrepreneurial side and and, and although I work in in a big company um I would say some of my most valuable skills that I cultivated at Cambridge was was being able to find answers being able to be trusted with a problem go figure it out I've been amazed in in my career and in 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 my life um at you know how quickly you can get ahead and and how 
far you, you stand out from the crowd when you have a curiosity to solve things and looking inwards and trying to you know, look under the hood and trying to figure things out even when I first started at, at Google I might not have been the most technical but I was always partly you know from the people I was around at uni partly from some of the stuff that you learn but the, how the academic rigorous approach teaches you to kind of look under the hood and try and figure things out for yourself and I think it stood me in a really great great place and I progressed very quickly uh, through some of the more junior ranks not because I had better technical skills to start with but because I was quite happy to try and figure things out and then become known as as somebody who um, could help others and was good at explaining things because he figured it out for himself and that, that has throughout my entire career has, has always been something I've tried to uh, to, to keep um, going with is being known as somebody you can find answers and, uh, and and ask the right questions and partly a lot of that comes from from time at uni and partly that can you know can be just something you have to to push onto yourself and it, it helps you um, figure things out as you go. So yeah, definitely agree with that sort of entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would echo that as well. Um, I did my MPhil at, New at Newnham's and I was only there for about five months because um, COVID hit March of um, that year. And so I'm not the best person to, to answer this question, but I would just say that um, sort of just taking advantage of everything because the... Um, I didn't do my undergrad at Cambridge, so I can't speak to that, but the postgrad um, life seems to be very kind of um, self-led. Um, and so you are responsible for taking advantage of things like going to an event like this is something I would try to do all the time. You know, I went to, I still remember the journalism panel that I went to, um, you know, I set up a meeting with Catherine actually to just go over my CV and just stuff like that. Um, and just going to events and just taking advantage of everything and sometimes you know people people would be surprised about the things that I was doing but it's just like knowing what's going on and just taking advantage of things um, because you never know um, how it might how it might be useful later on mm -hmm. but yeah I think that sort of taking initiative and um, you know being able to um, try new things is is still sort of values that I need every day. How about you, Jess? Is there anything you particularly did while you were at Cambridge that you felt coming really useful? I think probably just more abstract things like um, MML. I mean, echo everything everybody else has said as well, but I'm not going to repeat it. But <laughs> MML, um, I think I was studying literature a lot and um, lots of what I do is about um, storytelling. I think lots of what you do in any marketing role is about storytelling um, and sort of narrative. And that's been really useful, like most concretely having written a book recently, but also in lots of other ways every day. I think that's been a really useful skill. But yeah, like living mm -hmm. and working under pressure for four years um, is definitely a, a good grounding for going into a career like this, I think. Yeah, good foundation. So there's a lot you can take away from your, your years here, certainly. Um, so just if I just direct this question to mainly to Courtney and Jess, um, obviously you've both built up your social media presence yourselves. Um, how driven do you need to be, do you think, to be successful in such a global industry? I mean, obviously there are millions, billions of, of you know, Instagram accounts and all that kind of thing out there um do opportunities present themselves to you or is it very much about you having to be wholly proactive really driven and getting yourself out there yeah <laughs> you have to be like super driven or you just get lost in like you're saying like the vastness of it all the internet is a huge place and um it's it's really about you constantly pushing yourself to up your quality, um, to get to know your community a lot more, constantly doing that research element of, okay, like how do we fine tune? How do we engage with different, you know, issues happening in my subject field for me? Um, as well as just constantly thinking about how to serve your audience better. Like I think about with two of my sisters and having this, you know, sisterhood community, 
how do we continue to bring them value and quality content and good conversations, but also engage with them well, especially as the community grows. So you're constantly thinking about how to get better. And it can sometimes feel quite draining because um, you're kind of like, oh, when will it be enough? But the the thing with it is, especially with self-employment is, if you don't work, you don't eat, like nothing is going to come to you, you have to go out and get it, whether that and create opportunities for yourself, really. And you do get to a point and a, a scale where people they know you, they know your name, they're familiar with your brand. And so they will bring you opportunities. But if you get complacent, you'll fall off. Like there's so many commu- um, creators, sorry, who I remember watching when I grew up, and then they decided, you know, for themselves they didn't want to do it anymore and now they've just become a memory and so if you want to stay relevant if you want to keep working if you want to grow you're really having to push that ball uphill yourself through your creativity and also your your entrepreneurial skill and your business acumen and that's just the reality of self-employed life I think the two things that like really stand you in good stead in this industry not even stand you in good stead like they're just not optional um one is that all of these platforms are based on algorithms that value consistency above most other things so you don't just show up when you want to show up you show up pretty consistently as much as you can like I'm going on my honeymoon in June and I'm already thinking about how I'm going to take 10 days without like actively producing and sharing content like consistency you 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 have to want it enough and be connected enough to what you're doing to have the energy to be able to show up every day or more or less every day um I mean it depends on the platform but and then the other thing is like strategy you're not going anywhere without a strategy and a sense of direction So the first thing you've got to do is sit down and think, like, what do I care about? How, what messaging do I want to put out into the world? How do I want people to perceive me and build a strategy around that? And um, yeah, I think if you don't have those two things, um, growth isn't really possible. Um, So like for me, it's never felt like a huge commitment because I take every day as it comes and I've always wanted to be there on that day but when you look back and you think actually for three years I worked the equivalent of a full-time job on top of my full-time job I wasn't earning any money from it I did it because I wanted to be there you know like that's mm. that's the kind of energy for it that I think you need to be able to make a mm. success and to what extent do you do you kind of liaise with or connect with other similar accounts on the platforms that you're on is that is networking a big part of a big element of what you do as well or is it are they just kind of competition how does that work no I think there's a really nice vibe amongst creators it's a relatively new (laughs) industry it feels a bit like the wild west but the connections that you make with one of with other people are like one of the best parts of it and they also give you the fuel to keep going and when you're doing something new like your first brand contracts and something goes wrong and it doesn't feel good that's who you turn to like really in the industry unless you've got management which most people don't have up to a certain level like that's that's who you've got like that's your equivalent of colleagues friends like who you would talk to down the pub after work and um like a quote-unquote normal job like um I think yeah building relationships with other creators it will help you grow (laughs) but it's also like really important to your well-being and your enjoyment of the job yeah yeah that's so true um I think because it's so it can sometimes feel lonely being a creator because you are from the majority of your journey doing everything Mm -hmm. yourself and so having people you can go to and be like I need to figure this out they've probably been through it as well so it's great to offload it's great to also learn and help you navigate the social media space Um, but also I think brands themselves when they engage with creators it's often because they kind of cluster people in the niche together so they're looking for okay you you pretty much share audiences one whilst you're an individual creator your audience member is probably subscribed to you and five other people like you and they go to you know you, the different platforms for different things so it's lovely to also connect with people and collaborate and you know let your community know hey like I know them I also support them and you build this kind of village in your corner of the internet mm-hmm. um and I was very like honored to be a part of YouTube Black's inaugural Black Voices Fund, which was like a group of Black 
creators from all over the world who were selected to kind of be taught different things about how to grow on the platform, how to turn your YouTube um, channel into a business, but also allowed you to connect with other creators globally. And it was so insightful and just such a valuable thing to have in terms of the networking aspect, as well as just the support and hearing the stories. I think, like Jess so perfectly put, it's like having colleagues and mm -hmm. you are in an industry which is constantly changing as well. So you pretty much won't always know everything and so having those connections not only with creators but people like William who work at YouTube or work at the platform you're working with on um, or brand people who work at the brands that you want to collaborate with such as like Nia it's so much easier it's so much easier to navigate the space because you feel less like a deer caught in headlights trying to conquer this big vast internet when you actually have people who are specialists in how to navigate it. Yeah, that completely makes sense. I can understand. I, I like the kind of analogy of having colleagues because it, otherwise it is very, very lonely, isn't it, at times, I guess. Um, you've talked a little bit about where the income comes from. So advertising, working with brands, that kind of thing. How how long was it before you felt confident enough to kind of make a living from social media, do you think? Or do you think that is that something that really kind of varies depending on what you're doing? I think it really varies yeah like I like I made the leap into doing this in November of last year but I'd been earning an income from it and running it like a business for a year or so before then um I also waited too long to monetize like I didn't understand how the sort of industry dynamics worked and that you know I wasn't supposed to be working for free or in exchange for a like product that costs 20 pounds like it takes a bit of time to get your footing and to feel confident asking somebody who works brand side to pay you for the work that they're asking you to do um I think in terms of building an audience and getting it to a point where it's monetizable um it will vary for everyone it will depend on your industry um but yeah it's going to take you years so the best time to start is definitely like now or yesterday yeah definitely okay. and I think it's also made easier sometimes when you have that kind of supplemental income so whether you're working full-time it can be hard because like Jess mentioned it's like doing two full-time jobs mm -hmm. but it you know if you've got that or in my case I was running CDB London for three years before I decided to you know pause that and be a full-time creator um, so I already had savings and things like that so you may want to think more practically in that sense if you're going to take the risk of because it is a risk it's a business it's an investment in yourself and your content so if you are going to take that risk you may want to have you know some savings a bit of a runway um, but also I am considered a micro influencer so I'm not even like I've probably got half the size of the platform Jess has for example but I've still been able to make a full-time income because I have built a very solid brand and I think also understanding branding and understanding how you can add value to big brands that already exist, but also how you have such a connection with your audience and how much big companies want access to that. Once you kind of have the conversations with fellow creators and people who work brand side about how valuable that is and how much of a currency that is, you start to realize that you can actually charge for things a lot earlier than you probably would think. And so I've been monetizing my YouTube channel since six months into it, um, not just through AdSense, but also brand collaborations and knowing that I'm creating quality content, not just because of my audience size, but also because of my production quality and investing in my equipment and learning different editing styles. I can create content for brands that doesn't even go on my platform, like user generated content, which they use and they pay me for as the producer of it. So things like that, the more you become aware, the more you know of all the very lucrative streams and sometimes it's even like relying on subscription content like patreon or other platforms which allow your audience to kind of get that further step in by paying you monthly i know um, a podcast um, team right now that is making about fifty thousand a month just from subscriptions in that way and that doesn't include you know youtube streams merchandise live events so i think with this you also have to treat your social media journey as something that needs a business model because everyone's is different so it's just like it's the same way with, like, with building a startup every startup is built differently because they all are working alongside different models business models so you have to decide what's going to be your social media business model because it looks different for everybody mm -hmm. but there are so many different ways to make money one thing that works for me may not work for another creator so 
it's all about looking at your options. And that's why you do have to start. If you do want to make money, you need to start looking at it as a business and you need to transition from, oh, I create, you know, I post pictures online. It's cute. It's a hobby. Mm. I've got a really cute camera to actually this is how I'm trying to kill it. This is the goals and putting all the things in place to, to do that. Mm. Nia, from the other side of things, actually working for a company, working on a, a social media strategy or a marketing strategy. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your kind of creative input in that? Obviously, there's kind of the organisation of it, but what sort of creative element do you do you have in in putting that together? Um, I think um, my company is quite unique, so I'll, I'll just speak from um, my company, but it might not be relevant um, to everyone. But um, uh, so we have like a you know wider business goals, and then we have a marketing strategy, then we have a content strategy, and then comes my social media strategy. So it all kind of feeds into um, the top um, business um, strategy so I think um, it's it's going to hugely vary and I think something that's important to mention that if if you know if you're someone that's interested in making TikToks or you know you specifically want to use Instagram or something but you also want to work for a company you need to think about what what is best for that company because that's what you're going to be doing it's not going to be um, you know I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter every day but you know if I if I was someone that wanted to make TikToks you know that wouldn't work because that's not that doesn't suit our strategy and our audience so I think just thinking about what do you enjoy doing the most and how that would fit into your role is really important um in terms of my creative input um like I said everything is very collaborative so I feel involved in like all different areas of our marketing team not just um social media and I am trusted with um certain things and like coming up with new ideas and um you know we've just started a podcast so there's there are different sort of areas that I'm involved in um but mostly my creative input is kind of coming up with the um the copy for the posts mm -hmm. and thinking of new ways to um you know put that out so whether it's like how do we cover an event in the best way possible how do we um you know vary our timeline do we do we want to start making videos and um things like that so it's it's hugely variable and I think it does really depend on the role but I think most important is thinking about you know would I be okay with m making this kind of content versus like mine is very writing heavy and that's something that I enjoy but if you wanted to make videos or you know photography then it would be you'd need a different um company yeah, different sort of outlet. Oh, so, Will, Nia's talked a little bit about liaising with lots of people in her organisation. To what extent do you liaise with the more creative teams? Because obviously your work's quite quite technical, um, but there is a creative element to it. So can you just sort of tell us a bit more about what that looks like? Sure. Um, pretty much every, uh, every different part of the business that, that I work with, they all want analysis they all want data they all want insights so the, even the very uh, creatively uh, minded and focused teams they always want to ensure that the decisions they're making are, are grounded in in data so whether it's something as simple as figuring out whether we want to work with Taylor Swift or Stormzy for our next campaign but we're trying to figure out who's got the more relevant audience in the more relevant regions um, you know who's got the more uh, engaging social presence so we, we do a lot a lot of that kind of stuff when i'm working with the creative folks who are throwing ideas around and they'll say okay we need, we need a couple numbers we need to understand you know which categories of content are resonating with 17 year olds in france right now because that might then stimulate our creative uh thinking or or as i said like artist selection or in fact understanding um which kind of social posts uh, are performing really well right now or what the current climate is like in the social media landscape what trends are are are, are relevant uh, what what kind of things are performing well um so those are the sorts of data points that I'll, I'll share on a regular basis um sometimes we do a regular sort of quarterly check-in on all all of not just the social but the on-platform behavior but there's also lots of sort of ad hoc requests like we said right now we've got a campaign for the for the brit awards uh, that YouTube is, is sponsoring coming up in what, uh, a week or two. And so what I've been doing with, with those guys is helping to understand what's our possible social strategy, look around that, um, which of the folks uh, who are performing might we be able to engage with or piggyback on a post of theirs and, and can we get uh, agreements in with them and that kind of stuff. So there's always an 
always a layer of data um, underneath these big decisions, these creative decisions. And so uh, the folks in those teams are often, often come to me and my teams uh, to help them with that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And what, what sort of roles are, are there any roles that are purely creative um, in your kind of field, your sort of environment? Or do you always have to have some kind of technical expertise? No, there, there are folks, I mean, I suppose, broadly speaking, when you, when you talk about creativity, there are there are folks who design marketing strategies, there are, mm -hmm. there are folks who manage the actual production of creative assets. Um, we, we work at YouTube with a lot of agencies, so we don't actually have too many purely creative folks ourselves, but, mm -hmm. you know, we have social media account managers who, who literally write the posts and literally uh, determine what we're going to put out there. We have folks who are uh, curating and and, and uh, giving feedback to creative agencies on the types of assets we want for our next campaign. So would I call them pure creative? I think I, I think that's fair to call them purely creative. But I, I think it's also relevant, as, as everyone else on this panel would say, um, you, you need to be able to think about performance, you need to be able to think about numbers, and we need to be able to think about uh, what's going to work. And, and that mm. often needs uh, some aptitude for, for working with data or being able to find that data. And it can be pretty straightforward or it can be, you know, uh, pretty sophisticated depending on how deep you want to go. Great. Sorry, Nia, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just forgot to mention that we, we have our own um, design team. So, you know, there are certain processes that things have to go through. And I think, um, you know, our branding, we want that to be really consistent, which is true for, um, you know, um, if you work for yourself as well, but um, mm. it it's harder for it to be like, um, you know, a self-serve thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I just thought I'd added that, add that on. Thank you, that's great. We'll just do another couple of questions because I'm keeping an eye on the time and I'd like to get to the, um, the audience questions as well and have enough time to get through those. So we have touched on it a little bit um, earlier on, I think, in the sense that the social media is often in the news concerning kind of misuse, misinformation, um, and you know, often the damaging effects it can have on the community, and particularly young people at the moment. Um, what sort of challenges or considerations does this present to your day-to-day -day work? And that's kind of to everyone, because I guess it's slightly different for all of you. What are your thoughts um, on that? As a creator, so I got um, into TikTok in early 2020 during the lockdown when it was like really having a moment and my TikTok following went from 2,000 to 120,000 in the space of a week and um, it began to become apparent that like all of these accounts who were following me were kind of like 12, 13 years old and I had to really sit down with myself and have a think about like what's your responsibility to this new audience you've got like they're not your age they're like children um they're using tiktok recreationally you know that the platform isn't necessarily going to put those safeguarding controls in place so like how can i responsibly create content for this audience um yeah and that onus felt very much on me um so yeah i think as a, as a creator like you usually have more sort of of a say than that in who your audience are and how they engage with your content but um yeah you do have to have a think about what you're putting out there especially when you know the audience is so big and and what you want to be putting out into the world yeah I completely agree I think being driven and motivated to create content which doesn't put your audience in danger, doesn't expose them to, you know, false information um, and abiding by the policies of the platform as well and not trying to be entirely too provocative for the sake of views um, definitely helps to do that. I think you have to be very mindful of the fact that it is people behind the numbers and it is people behind the screens. Um, and so kind of for me, when I create, I envision that I am talking to another human being or a group of people rather than just you know a camera because I think that humanization helps to remind you that you, there are lines that you shouldn't cross um, as well as even reminding yourself of that through engaging with your audience as well and not just seeing it as I'm putting out content to the world but actually these are people who are taking time to view me and allowing me to impact them in some way especially for the nature of the content I consume um, but I even think with the two my sisters podcast we delve a lot into the 
constructedness of social media and how it is still a narrative and how, you know, we have to kind of break that fourth wall in a sense, the same way you would watch a film and appreciate that there's lighting and there's makeup and there's, you know, cuts and edits. That's the same with online content. So kind of being honest as well with our audience that don't get too caught up in this illusion. This is purely entertainment. Um, I think also helps, especially being in the lifestyle and beauty space. I've seen so many people kind of, you know, develop body dysmorphia or a lot of um, mental health struggles surrounding their expectations about life and their feelings towards their own real life because of the repeated images they're exposed to online. So sometimes just letting my audience know this is what the behind the scenes look like. These are the lights, the cameras, the action kind of helps to um, give them the reality of what's going on behind the images that they consume yeah. from me. Will, did you want to add a little bit to that? Because you touched on the, you know, the kind of behavioural side of things. Yeah, sure. It's, it's sort of very much part of my my day to day is, mm. is uh, monitoring for conversation around harmful topics, around information, uh, misinformation, sorry, and, you know, have multiple, multiple different sort of topics and themes that, that we are, are listening to. And, and my responsibility, my remit would fall within the, the ability to flag that up to the folks who are making decisions around uh, content and around creators on, on YouTube um, and being able to give them a, an, an insight into, you know, is this an issue that we ought to be thinking about addressing? Is this a policy that's unclear? Is this something that's we're seeing repeatedly? Uh, and then that will lead to decisions about perhaps modifying policies or um, speaking to creators or taking action against creators or even something you know more more straightforward like deciding we need to put together a marketing campaign um, on how to YouTube how to use YouTube safely or how to promote YouTube kids which is our you know kid friendly um, environment so yeah absolutely those sort of different um, topics they're all gathering information on that and sharing it to, to, to ensure that the right folks are able to to, to make changes. Great, thank you. I think we'll just, I'll just go to Catherine and see if we have any questions yet. Catherine, are you there? You are. Hi. Um, yeah, we haven't yet, but we have fixed a chat. So if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, if you can just pop it in the chat, um, that would be great. That would be uh, I'll, I think. I'll kick off. Oh, there we go. Um, have we got one already? Yeah, we've got a nice long one there. Do you want to read that one out? Can you see it, Catherine? Yeah, half an hour is long. Um, right. <laughs> Thank you so much for all your guys' inspiring contributions throughout this panel. I really like Courtney's segment on the niche and the opportunity to connect with people sharing your passion. On that note, Jess and Courtney, what do you think is the best way to find one's niche as a creator that both fuels your creativity and catches the eye of others? Is it just trial and error or starting with what you love or is there some method to the magic? Thank you. Um, I'd say start with what you love and then see what people are responding to and how they're responding to it. Um, I think it comes down to also just having an idea in mind of what you think would be cool. You know, what content would you like to watch or see um, and how can you make that different from whatever's out there or add a spin to whatever's out there so that you can stand out? Um, I think with niches as well I don't have a niche so I'm one of those interesting creators who's like and that's why it's the whole like umbrella term of lifestyle it's like what does that actually really mean just means everything you know so I'm very much because I am more so like a public figure as a person my personhood is the brand if that makes sense so I get to do whatever I want and talk about whatever I want but that also means that I have to be willing to be quite personable online whereas you may you know because of your desires and the person that you are um, and what you want may not want to be so personally attached to your online platform um so you know you can create content which doesn't feature your face doesn't have your name as well and that may be more niched down so whereas people may come to my content because the niche is me they may come to your content because the niche is food or you know a specific kind of food so I think it comes down to what are your desires what do you enjoy and what would be easy for you to create as well because you don't want to lack passion surrounding the content that you have to make consistently so those are the things I'd say to get you started Great, thank you very much. Um, anyone got any anything else to say on that one, or should we 
go to the next question. Yeah, I think um, what Courtney's saying is totally right. Like there are lots of different ways that you can make a compelling identity for yourself online, but um, whichever way you choose to do it is going to require some thought. I think um, starting with what you love is good advice. Like a good early thing to do you can be throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks and you will eventually it will become apparent through looking at your data and your analytics like what you're creating where the sweet spot is between what you're creating that you love and what you're creating that's resonating with your audience um and then you can do more of that ad infinitum <laughs> um but yeah i think it's something that's definitely worth thinking about and you'll know when you get somewhere that that sits well with you and people are kind of moving between niches all the time i think like a really good example of that is like parenthood like when creators that you know and have been following for a long time become parents quite often the their output really changes um and it is possible to move from creating one type of content to another but starting with a niche especially in those early stages is like a really good way of guaranteeing growth i think thank you great advice um and another question for jess and courtney um Aside from diversifying your business, how did you manage to make social media your only source of income? And how do you make it reliable enough on an ongoing basis to leave part-time roles? Make that leap. Um, so I, I mean, this is basically just diversifying income, but you know, I'm, I'm still consulting on the side. Like I worked in social media management and I've left a full-time role, but, um, I'm still keeping one foot in that camp because I do not yet consider this reliable enough as a source of income that I'm prepared to stake everything on it for the next five, 10 years. Like this is a rapidly changing market and we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I like, um have got my head around quite early I think like thinking of it as a business planning financially like it's a business making sure that there's money in the business and a buffer um that I've got runway um it's essentially like running a bootstrap startup on a really tiny scale um so just taking it seriously and, and being realistic I completely agree. I think the key to making enough money um that is reliable enough is to have a diversity of things that you do so the way I see it is my social media pages are like the stem but what really brings the fruit is the branches so you know the um if it's merch if it's subscriptions if it's events um book deal speaking engagements brands that like associate with the content I make so CDB London was an offshoot of the fact that I made a lot of beauty and hair related content so it's like let me instead of just promoting other brands, let me make my own. Um, so the offshoots really are what makes it very fruitful, but without the stem of the social media content and building that community, the, the offshoots don't really exist as well, unless you focus on making them strong enough to be their own stem. So really scaling up a company or you know, really leaning into a subscription model. And most social media people they're not just a YouTuber or an Instagrammer, they really are a business. And so we can't really talk about making a sustainable amount of money unless you're getting crazy views, like Mr. Beast views, like you're not really gonna be making, I wouldn't say a full-time income to give you a really comfortable life to you know, be able to invest in a cost of living crisis and all of that from just YouTube AdSense, unless you're doing insane views. And if you wanna put all your eggs in that basket, that's fine, but most people don't. It doesn't work that way because that's when it becomes unpredictable because of algorithms and changes and viewer behavior and all the things that like, you know, William focuses on at work, like behavioral patterns and all of that. It can just change. And so you don't ever want to be in a position where you can't pay the bills because people's behavior has changed or maybe a video gets copyright flagged because you used the wrong music in the background. Um, so you really want to have as many streams as possible that you enjoy and that make up the overall uh business that is your social media presence yeah um, absolutely can I add to that again <laughs> just from recent learning like if you're quite an anxious person like this is an anxiety inducing position to be in um like your income changes 
really dramatically from month to month like over the last year I've had months where I've made like zero pounds and zero pence and I've had months where I've made more money than I would have considered possible and you never know what's coming around the corner so um I think you also have to be realistic about like what kind of personality you have and how well suited you might be to this and that's why I think doing it in parallel with something else is a really good way of making sure that you've got a buffer and that you're looking after yourself emotionally as well as practically and financially um until you know until you're in the place where you want to give it a shot full time absolutely and you never know what the general public is going to suddenly go viral over uh, this week, there's a Canadian dog walking company who put their dogs on a bus and posted it on Instagram. And they went from a few Alaskan or Canadian, or wherever it was, a few views to being a global set of superstars and they're making money hand over fist. Uh, um, who knew? You know, who knew? Who that knew? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what's so interesting doing about the same that. thing in Germany mm-hmm. and it hasn't. So, exactly knew? taken off. And I, I think what's so interesting about that, because that's a great example, is people think that as soon as you get increased views or you have a moment of virality, that's it. The cash cows, like all of it is coming home. You've blown. And the truth is a lot of people experience those moments of virality and don't actually make any money from it or don't make enough money from it for a, a long period of time because they don't understand the business of social media. So equipping yourself with that knowledge of how to turn a viral moment into a career is is really important and it takes a skill and it takes a lot of education and conversations and coming to things like this and having creator friends or you know people who you know work in the business of social media at a company or whatever to be able to know how to ride that wave because just because you went viral doesn't mean you're gonna now be able to survive as a full-time creator and if if you do have that perspective you'll always want to go viral and the thing about virality is it can't always be pinned down to a strategy. Um, if not, if it could, I mean, all of us would have the same Twitter following as YouTube, right? But we don't. <laughs> so it's more so about sometimes it's a bit of luck and just consistency enough so that you can have that wave of luck quite often. But don't bank on just a viral moment to transform your whole life. I agree with that. And like, I... I think you can get too caught up in um, like the metrics and analytics and stuff. But um, I think the best social media strategy is just the most simple, you know, who do I want to reach? What do they want to see? And and what kind of content am I going to use to do that? And just focus on producing really good quality content. And like, also don't just focus on building a community, like foster the community you already have. And, you know, the sort of the, keeping that consistent will bring success, I I believe. Um, So I totally agree. It's not, you know, you might think when you go viral, it's basically what Courtney said that, you know, that's it. But I think it's much more um, sustainable to focus on building the community and not neglecting, you know, people who are already, um, you know, interacting with you and appreciating what you're doing for the sake of like more followers or, you know, because I think, that would, will be short-lived. Thank you. That actually leads on very nicely to the next question, which was um, somebody is, it can be a bit overwhelming when you start out and struggling with feeling like there's a, a lot to learn, particularly about content strategy and producing high quality posts, um, especially in short-term video. Can anyone recommend any really good resources for learning the skills that you need for creating really good quality content and running social media pages um youtube (laughs) for everything youtube 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 um like i i youtube i use youtube every day to learn how to do youtube university trust me um yeah so any anything specific any specific people you learn from or just google what you need to know literally like use use youtube as like a search engine how do you edit on this how do i cut on imovie how, literally no question is simple enough somebody maybe hundreds of people have made a three minute video address or a 30 minute video addressing the issue that you have um because youtube is full of creators who are creating content about creation 
So it's important to kind of, you have to be very proactive um, and you have to use a lot of initiative. And because social media is always changing, it's great because you also have updated content very regularly. And so the more you search, the more you'll find those niche channels that talk about what it is you're trying to do, subscribe to them, keep up with them. But, you know, there are other platforms like Skillshare, but Skillshare, like you have to pay for it. So YouTube is just great because all the information is already there. Google, there's blog posts, there's forums, there's Reddit threads all about like how do you do xyz and people just sharing their experiences I have literally been an uh, engineer a lighting and sound engineer like all of it through YouTube University and so can't recommend it enough Um, just keep your eye out for the updated information all the time like never assume that you know everything Um, just keep searching and keep asking questions Um, also sorry I did want to say very very briefly sorry back to the earlier part of the question it can be overwhelming when you start and just start where you are because even if it's not you know your most ideal I go back and look at my earliest videos I was using like comic sans font to write text on the screen it was brutally bad like it was really bad but if I hadn't have started then and I hadn't have kept practicing and being consistent I wouldn't be where I am now and I'm sure that in two years I will look back at the content I'm producing now and think that was not it but it I wouldn't have got to that point unless I had started so it's it may not be what everyone else is doing but I think also pay attention to the videos that are succeeding because especially with something like TikTok Sometimes it's the most janky videos that go viral because they have so much more behind it than just production quality. They're authentic. They are funny. They are entertaining. They're educational. And so also don't be too hard on yourself if your production quality isn't up there. Um, Sometimes you just need the core elements of storytelling and, you know, knowing how to retain people's attention. And that's it. I can't speak too much to the, the creative stuff, although Courtney and... And, and folks have been talking about that really well. Um, but what I do see is is the number of creators who start every day or the number of creators who we call them creators getting started. Uh, we see on YouTube, and I'm sure this is very similar on, on all social media platforms, uh, but you'd be amazed how many people start and then give up real quick and exit um, the final. It's something obviously that we're concerned with at YouTube and we're interested in, in, in making easier. But the, the message I have you know, for you guys is, it's been mentioned already, uh, discipline, consistency, don't worry too much about it being perfect, but keep getting it out there because it's hard to know what will resonate. Uh, the longer you're on the platform for, the more likely the platforms are likely to flag you as a good, safe account and your video goes into a discovery pool, which means you're more likely to get picked up. So what I would say is from the back end side, which you know I don't know too much about, but I, I can say we see so many people start and then they are not retained as creators because they didn't see success in their first couple of videos. And those folks are, are, are missing out on potentially, you know, making it happen for themselves if they kept on going. And I think what that says, right, is you have to pick something that you, you're passionate about and that's easy enough for you to create on um, in order for that to, to be possible. So that's, that's my sense there, yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question may have a very similar answer. So if it does, just say, refer to the last answer. Um, and that's how you manage to gain that initial following. And is there a way to make it easier for people to find you on, online when there is so much content out there? How do you, is there some secret way of, of making the audience that you're looking for actually find you? I think in the early days, like find them. So um, find the people that they're following, connect with those people, find creators your size who are just starting out in a similar like niche to you um, and connect with those people. Um, Use the hashtags uh, or use the search function to find other people's content about what you're writing about. Get in the comments section. Like it's all about connecting with people and being visible as a consumer of content as well as as a creator of content and I think that's like a really great building block I think in the first year that I was managing my Instagram account I was spending like an hour a day in the feed with other people's content like getting to know people um and I think it made a really big difference 
I completely agree. I think also, you know, titling your videos or your content in ways that allow the algorithm to kind of push it to the right group of people. So, you know, mentioning those keywords, if it's about makeup, right, mentioning the name of the brand or the specific product so that people who are searching for it can actually find it. Um, I would also say just make sure that you're not being shy about the fact that you're creating content. I think a lot of people kind of want to create and post in secret and then kind of be like, oh, but no one's watching it. It's like, because you're posting in secret, you've got to be loud about it, you know, share it. When I created my first video, I posted it on my Facebook feed, my Instagram, like cross market across all your platforms and let everybody know, even if it's just your friends and family, hey, watch this, let me know what you think, drop a comment, like it. Till now, my sister is like, one of the first people to comment on any video I dropped. She's like, this was such a great video. It's like, it's been up for six minutes and it's 25 minutes, but she's always ready to go. So, you know, making sure that you get support from your organic circle as well to break you in a bit. Thank you very much. Um, thank you guys so much. This has been really insightful. Um, so that's the next one. Um, how do you deal with overthinking if you do experience that? when you're trying to ensure that you're translating yourself authentically in terms of your persona, do you ever get too caught up in your head with overthinking what you're doing? And how do you get over that? Um, I think sometimes I do, but then I just remind myself that I can edit anything out. Like the final form of the content is doesn't have to look like what was initially filmed. And that's the beauty of just, content creation you can go in reshoot re-edit if it's not exactly how you want it to be um but also I think just relax a bit like the internet is a lot more casual than you think um and th this is a long game you know if you're going to be consistent there are a lot of other videos which you're going to make so this one not being perfect is fine it's not like an essay or like final exams where it's like oh what I write here is what's going to be you know determining my whole degree you can delete a video if you're like ah that was five years ago I was done that I'm going to delete that it's fine um as long as you're proud of it when it goes out and you're not you know too obsessed with perfection but you are proud you're good you're all good thank you there's um, a good question here about drawing a line between um, your professional life and your personal life, particularly when they are so bound up with each other. Um, I guess that that's probably you, Jess, you know, your personal life with your dog is also your living in a way. Um, how do you keep control of that, both in terms of how much you share about yourself online and also spending time away from social media? How do you keep creating content at times when you aren't feeling very confident or your self-esteem is a bit low, but you know you have to keep churning stuff out? Um, well, um, this is like the biggest conundrum <laughs> of my career. Um, I think if you, in terms of like getting a balance between spending time on and offline, I have never worked that out. So I'll let Courtney speak to that because... I suck at it. Um, but in terms of like what I choose to share and what I don't, it's a constant dialogue that I'm having with my partner. Um, like what, what is visible of our home, what is visible of our life, our location. Um, you know, I know now I've learned <laughs> the hard way that if I post a video of my dog on what I think is a completely nondescript beach in the middle of nowhere in Wales, um, I will immediately get comments from people who know exactly where I am. Like I recognize that gate is your house, this one. Like, you know, I've had to learn the challenging way that, um, you do have to constantly be thinking about this stuff and and where you draw that line is um you know it moves it changes um it changes for like my partner as well what he wants to be private about I mean he's not on social media at all in a personal capacity um so yeah it's just something that, that we're in constant dialogue about and it changes what I feel comfortable with and what I don't but I just go with my gut I think Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm the exact same. Like my priorities are my safety and my privacy. And so for me, knowing the purpose of why I create and what I create helps me to know that I don't need to overshare or I don't need to, you know, do anything for views, which I am not comfortable with. And I think it's important for you to remember that you are in control of your platform as much as it is, is a community thing. And it's beautiful to have built a community 
you are the leader of that community. And so you determine the flow of things and also you set the boundaries as well. So for me, as much as um, I love my community, I love the girls in the sisterhood, um, they are very much aware of the things that we will and will not discuss. And, you know, we can respectfully let them know, but also as time goes on and you build a brand, you build a platform and you build a voice, people kind of get used to what they can and cannot see. Um, and that's completely fine. There will always be people who want to kind of overstep or want to do the whole, oh, is this where you are and stuff? And you can just let them know, I'm not going to share that or just not respond at all. Um, but for me, safety really is important. So, you know, being mindful of, I don't share my live location. I mean, I was literally talking about this on a podcast earlier that like, I've been I traveled to like nine countries last year I didn't start releasing all of that footage till December just because it wasn't time specific so I think also leveraging the fact that you don't have to share everything at real time as much as that may seem like a great content strategy um, it's not wholeheartedly necessary because time is a social construct regardless let alone on the internet you know so as long as you're being consistent you can always be very intentional about what you release when what you say and how um, and what you take out as well thank you very much um there's quite a technical question coming up um there's somebody who's worked as an intern in tiktok's trust and safety department um with responsibilities quite similar to william's job um and they noticed there is a trend in these companies that they rely on data analysis tools to support their work um, this person is a liberal arts student who's struggled a bit with quantitative research methods. Um, should they keep pushing themselves to maybe learn more advanced Python or SQL um, beyond the sort of computer language and copywriting capacity? Um, what kind of technical skills like that are social media company employers looking for? I can take that one. Um, good question. Um, whenever I speak to anybody who's interested in working in tech, I, I, my default answer is usually, it's always a good idea to um, be more technically inclined than less, even if your job doesn't require it, because it just gives you additional powers and additional capabilities that, that some of your colleagues won't have. And, and because there's so much complexity out there in the company, you know, you have room to grow into it. But the answer to your question is no, definitely, definitely, definitely do not need Python. Uh, SQL is a lot easier and um, I think most people can learn that at, at a moderate level with you know just like in a day so I think SQL is not a bad one um, to have in your arsenal but definitely don't need Python um, that would you know be only required in the most advanced uh, technical analysis roles or in the engineering side of things so um, definitely always challenge yourself to to have technical skills uh, up to the limit that you're comfortable with because they're going to always be useful in, in some point but you don't need um advanced python uh, no, don't worry about that um yeah i'll just add on um that i didn't need any any experience from my role um all they asked was um writing experience and um an aptitude for picking up technical aspects and that's not um anything to do with analytics or anything it's just that our product is really te technical so you need to be able to speak about that um but yeah python is definitely like a so software engineer role and, and there are specific roles like seo and you know, um specialist and um you know someone who works more in like digital marketing where you do need to know those um things in certain cases but i think it really depends on the role you definitely it's definitely not something that you need um in order to work in social media because usually those are quite distinct areas um so yeah i i don't i you don't <laughs> thank you right that's all the, is that all the questions in the chat catherine that was all the ones from the chat yeah yeah we've, we've just got a couple in the q a that have, have popped up we've just got five minutes or so um there's one here that says in terms of brand deals would you say there are any sorts of language or terms terminology you would say people should look out for so perhaps you know is a kind of specific language around working with brands I, I imagine they mean something along those lines um yeah I think the the main 
responsibility of a creator is just to understand the brief so every brand is going to come to you with a creative brief around what they want you to create and you just want to make sure that you can bridge and find that very nice um, balance between your style and not losing your style that your audience is already used to and also satisfying the brand and making sure that they've gotten what they want and what they need so whenever you participate with brands, they really are very open to you having discussions, pitching ideas. Um, brand deals can happen quite quickly. So you do have to be on it when an opportunity comes, but be ready to engage in conversation and ask as many questions as possible, pitch different ideas. Um, and even if a brand hasn't in, approached you, you can approach a brand and keywords that I'd say mentioning would be you doing your research on what the brand stands stands for, what their marketing already looks like, and then kind of pitching it back to them. So you know when you are applying for a job and then you go and you read the role description of what they're looking for and then you scatter those words throughout your CV or your cover letter, it's the exact same thing. So that's the sort of approach you want to take if you are approaching brands um, to say, hey, let me create content for you or let me work on this campaign. And presumably if they if they approach you they're doing so because they like your style yeah like your yeah kind of output as well exactly they I find that when brands have approached you they've pretty much already made the decision they're just trying to understand if you fit in their budget so that's it I would say that um you begin to at the beginning it feels very hectic and like difficult to navigate but you begin to be able to recognize the difference between like a good brand deal and a bad brand deal when they land in your inbox like there'll be a lot of things floating around that look like brand deals but actually aren't some of them are even like there's scammers who pretend to be to be like brands looking to make deals there's all sorts of you know it's the wild west um but you do kind of begin to get familiar with the language. I would say there's lots of, I love a Facebook group <laughs> and there's lots of great Facebook groups for like influencers and content creators. And you can always like share a screenshot in there and people can give you feedback. Um, and the other terminology thing that I would say is you're going to have to get familiar with contracts. Like there's going to be a lot of contracts floating around. They're going to be other people's contracts. Some of them will be a one pager. Some of them will be 10 pages long and quite scary. Um, but it's just about like, I think, reaching out to people, networking, like other creators or anybody that you know, um, to have a look over that contract for you and always push back if there's something that you're not sure about or you don't want to sign, don't sign it. Like um, people are very prepared to to make changes and adjustments for you. Thank you. There's just one. Lesson. I'm not entirely sure what's what's meant by this question, but it says, can you tell us about a time when you saw an opportunity in this sector, went for it and it went and it worked out really well? I would say that's applies to all um, of you I guess <laughs> yes I'd say for me the YouTube Black Voices Fund was a huge one um being able to it was basically like a fund and a grant um which was a year long and it was actually my best friend Renee my co-founder who sent it to me like hey I think you'd be really good for this you are a black and a creator so apply and I did kind of just thinking it was you know a good way to just build relationships with the team mm -hmm. at YouTube um only to discover it came with like a really big life-changing grant um as well as you know connections with other creators and stuff so I'd also say look out for opportunities which um allow you to grow as a creator and not just you know work with brands but actually investing in becoming a better business person making those relationships um so that you can just support yourself on this journey a lot better and you know any way you can interact with the platform you're creating content for or you know using for marketing is really really great like it will never be a down there would never be many downsides to it if I'm going to be honest Great. Anybody, anybody else wants to, I guess you've all had that experience because you're all working in social media and, and successful. So that's, that's all great. But I think, I hope that's covered that question. Um, so I think we've come to the end of our questions. There aren't any, aren't any more coming up and we've actually, we're on bang on 530, which is, which is ideal. So I just want to say thank you so much to all our panellists today. You were all fantastic. We got some really great insight into the variety of roles available, you know, the opportunities available in this huge sector and growing sector as well. So I'm sure that's given our audience some really fantastic inspiration. Um, and thank you to our audience for coming today as well.
as I said, we'll be putting this on YouTube. So if you want to look back at any of the session at all, you're very welcome to. That could be over the next week or so. Um, and I'll be sending out a feedback form for you as well, if you wouldn't mind just filling that in um, for us as well. So we'll bring the session to a close and say thank you very much indeed. <laughs>